We're starting to offer our customers a series of programs to help uh, both the grid and our customers with their bills. And so n creating programs that marry those two interests together, that's part of my job. Okay. So um, today we talked <coughs> to uh, two people that are part of the, I think it's the demand response, but where you guys can control their thermostats. Oh, okay. Well, we <laughs> okay. Is that something different you're not ready to talk about? No, 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 no. We, <coughs> it's tough to say that we control the thermostat as much as we're sending a request to the thermostat to respond in some way. I mean, I don't, we don't control the thermostats. That's a bit intrusive. <laughs> Customers don't want that. So you send it to Nest and Nest sends it to the thermostat. The thermostat. And, and so what happens in a, in a program like that or a request like that is the thermostat takes into account what the customer wants from their thermostat, which is either a cool or a warm home. And it will adjust. So if it knows when the period of the event is, so normally it will run an event for maybe four hours. And if it knows when the event period is, it'll adjust the temperature up. Let's say it's, um, it's the winter. So it'll adjust the temperature up a couple degrees before the event period. And then during the event period, it'll go down the normal preset that the customer wanted so that it can ride through that event and not demand additional electricity from the grid during that period of time while keeping the customer comfortable. That's the idea. Gotcha. So it's just a couple of degree or two. And so a degree or two from each individual customer adds up to a whole bunch of savings. Do you roughly, how many people are part of that program with you guys? Uh, I believe we have 20,000 customers enrolled right now. Okay. And so really one or two degrees makes that big a difference? That's right. Most customers are fine with it. They don't notice. Um, they actively participate. They're happy to participate and they're compensated for that. Uh, one person we talked to was a little frustrated because she keeps her house already relatively cool, cool. during the winter. Oh. She's at like 64 or 65 and when the event comes it takes it down to 63 or something like mm -hmm. that. Is there no way to personalize it like that? So she has the opportunity to, she, she can opt out of any event and she can also dial her thermostat back to, let's say normally she wants her thermostat at 65 and the thermostat automatically adjusts to 63. She could adjust it to 64 and still be considered participating. Okay. Okay. Her argument was you should look for the people that are the energy hogs and use it with them, but not with people like her. Well, you know, people, it's an opt-in program. So we ask for people to participate and they don't have to. Do you think that that's a, uh, is that going to be a trend of the future though? Yes. Um, so if we're going to, Tradition, energy is the only commodity that has to be consumed the instant it's generated. And the grid, as you can see, has to always be in balance, right? In the past, we have used thermal generation to, to meet demand or chase demand. So if demand went up, thermal generation went up. Well, in the future, when we want to decarbonize the system, the fuel source is intermittent. And so the resources that provide energy to the customer are in minute. So they move around. And so demand is going to have to move around just as much as the generation. And we call this flexible resources. And having that sort of dynamic with our customers is going to be a new service paradigm that we're looking to see and prepare our customers for. And how we do that, how we create that partnership is a lot of what I do. But will people really do it? I mean, what's the percentage that are doing it? So in a typical, what we call uh, an event like this, sort of peak resource of event like this, we might see anywhere between um, two and 7% participation from customers. But in the future, so that's just a few megawatts of resource that we are receiving from our customers. In the future, we're going to be working with our customers in different types of resources, not just thermostats, but electric vehicles and batteries, water heaters, um, rooftop solar units, um, maybe even your refrigerator. 
okay, to provide a whole host of services to the system. So in the future, when we need to be meeting our greenhouse gas targets for the state of 80% below uh, where we were now, um, we'll need almost a quarter of our total resources to come from that side of the system, from the customer side of the system. That's 900 megawatts. That's a lot of resource. And that's a big jump from two to 7%. To that's right. So um, we're conducting a project called the Smart Grid Testbed Project, PGE's Smart Grid Testbed Project. And in that project, we're looking for 66% participation from our customers. Now that project is situated at three different substations and three different communities. So in Milwaukee is participating, North Portland is participating, and South Hillsboro is participating in that project. 20,000 customers. And what we're looking for is what we call the sustainable customer value proposition. It's kind of wonky. A little bit. <coughs> but. Glad you, glad you hear that as it's coming in. Yeah. But um, we know that just a few dollars uh, per event might not be enough to really induce customers to participate in the long term. So what are the other value propositions? So this January, testbed customers in that project will be able to take those dollars that they've received from participating in those programs and give them back to local charities. So okay. that's one sustainable value proposition we're looking into. Another one is how much carbon are they responsible for reducing for participating in each event? How much renewables did they help bring onto the system for participating in events? We are looking right now to work with a vendor, we're, vet, we're vetting a vendor who might be able to help us take over generation from rooftop solar units and allow those customers to sell that generation to the community or give it to somebody in need. So being able to work with the community and work with the resources on the distribution system to make it a more equitable and sustainable system is the idea. And as far as the, uh, the, the details of the test bed program, I understand everybody is automatically opted in and you have to right. ask to be out. That's right. So with the test bed, all those customers, all those residential customers were opted into that project. Now they can opt out at any time and for that project they're opted into what's known as the peak time rebate program. This means that they take normal service and a few times out of the year we'll ask them if they'll reduce and if they do we'll pay them for that reduction. Now if they don't reduce then they just take at, at normal cost. Okay. And um, what are you finding, well when did this start? We started in July is when we first started calling events for that project. Okay. And what are you finding as far as participation? We're seeing that our testbed customers are performing as well, if not better, than the rest of the service territory, both in terms of the number of events that they're participating in and the amount of reduction that they give us. And you haven't had, or have you had widespread opting out? No, we haven't. We've had less than a hundred, I believe, opt out of that particular project. And for the most part, it's been a, uh, an issue around communication. So because we took a large population and opted them into a program, we didn't necessarily have everybody's cell phone number or everybody's email account. So for the first event, some customers saw a text message from us because we, we couldn't send it to an email because we didn't have their email address. And they simply said, well, stop texting me. And by doing so, they, they opted out of the program. I'm not sure that they're aware that they opted out of the program altogether. And so we're going to be sending some information to them to see if they understood that that's really what happened. So we're learning about communications to customers as part of that project. But it sounds like you have something like 95 or 96% participation, or maybe that stayed in. Well, we did have about, we have about 4,000 customers in the test bed that had a prior relationship with us. Prior, they communicated to us that they didn't want to be communicated to by us. They didn't want material around um, programs or anything like that. They just wanted their bill. 
And so those 4,000 customers are not actually part of the project. We're trying to see if there's other ways that um, we can communicate with them to let them know that they are part of the project and that there's an opportunity here. Uh, those materials will go out in the next few weeks. Okay. So we have roughly 56% participation right now, okay. uh, upwards of 60. But that number maybe is l artificially low because of that 4,000. I believe so, yes. Okay. You call an event, mm -hmm. you communicate some way to in each individual customer the way they want to be communicated. Yes. And then you watch with their smart meter to see whether they actually lower their use. Yeah, so the smart meter sends us usage data back, and we compare that usage data to a baseline. And it's a counterfactual in the sense that what would they have been using that particular day had an event not taken place? And the difference between that is what we pay them against. Okay. Uh, okay. And I sort of already asked you this, but just to go over it one more time, is this going to be the future? Is this the way that power is going to be saved and the uh, environment is going to be saved? So I think we're working toward a future here. This is just the beginning. So we actually have a, a very interesting water heater program, which I think is a better representation of what the future would look like. Okay, we actually toured one of the apartment complexes. That's that right. It's part of that. So we called that particular program, I think, 59 times between December and February, and the customers didn't notice. So a water heater is a very interesting appliance in the sense that customers just want hot water. But it could supply a whole host of grid services back to the grid. So it can respond in f less, th less than five minute increments to the grid and to grid needs. And it can store you know, energy in the form of hot water for a good period of time. So let's say wind energy is super cheap right now. Uh, or it is super cheap for the next hour. Well, we could ask those water heaters to heat the water up at that period of time and soak up that cheap electricity. I see, okay. To bring on that additional renewables. Huh. Interesting, okay. Um, so there could be a day when most of Portland's water heaters are going up and down controlled by artificial intelligence? Yeah, so there's an algorithm inside the switches that we use on these water heaters that take into account when the customer wants hot water, when they're normally using hot water, um, and that balances our requests for services. But it always puts a priority on for the customer to receive the hot water. And in the aggregate, even if you have uh, just a few water heaters that can't perform during an event, the large group will make up for the, the difference. So in the aggregate, you get the resource you're looking for. And do you, this may be too specific, and it's, I'm, we won't use it against you if you don't know, but uh, the, uh, so Monte Vista Apartments, I think there's 288 apartments out there. Okay. That was the place we went. I was wondering, any idea how much energy is saved by using those, or maybe system-wide, by the hot water heater things you're using? So I think right now, among the number of buildings, we have roughly half a megawatt from that small project and we're looking to acquire four megawatts from that pilot project in the next two years. Okay, that's the Monte Vista so, one. Yeah, well not just Monte Vista, with that whole uh, water heater program. Okay. Um, and it's just a pilot, it's a way for us to learn how to do this yeah. and how to make sure that our customers are comfortable with the approach and that we're getting the services that we need, that they're being compensated correctly as well. And what about the psychology of changing the customer behavior or making them comfortable with it? You know, you don't even like the, you don't like the term of you're controlling their thermostat. That's right. And it's because of the psychology of it, right? Yeah. So we would like for people to get it, love it, and forget about it. And in order to do that, you need some brains inside these pieces of equipment, inside the appliance. And so a lot of appliances, like I just purchased a washer and dryer this week. I think our washer and dryer is 20 years old. So we purchased a new washer and dryer and it came with a Wi-Fi. So it's Wi-Fi connected. Those, that's enough smarts for us to talk to, the, to that system and to ask for services from it. And in the future, the idea is that the customer can provide the utility with services and the utility could pay the customer 
for those services. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean, Jason? So let's say you have a solar rooftop. Okay. Let's say you have a let, let's say you have a battery or an electric vehicle or a smart hot water heater or a smart thermostat. All of these devices have a certain amount of smarts in them and they can operate in the background and provide the services to the customer in the home while also providing services to the grid. And the utility will pay the customer for those services that the appliance can provide. So I get it with solar. If I've mm -hmm. got extra electricity more That's than right. my house can use, you could buy it from me. That's right. Even though it'd be relatively small. Mm -hmm. But what else in my house would would have any benefit for you? So um, let's say you have a smart water heater. Most people have a water heater, and a lot of the new water heaters that are coming out have are Wi-Fi enabled. So let's say we could talk to that water heater, and we could ask that water heater to ramp down a little bit during some portion of the day, or to ramp up during some portion of the day. Those, those are energy services that our grid can see in the aggregate, where we're asking customers either to use less or to use more. And the water heater is a great appliance because it looks a lot like a battery to the grid, because it can actually store electricity in the form of hot water, or it can forego the use of electricity, and so it can ultimately help lower demand. Gotcha. So with the hot water heater, that's your windmill example, or turbines. Yeah. Cheap power, hey, hot water heater, heat up this water now so we don't have to heat it up later with more expensive energy? Yeah, more expensive or more carbon content, you know, energy that has a higher carbon content. Because okay. the, the goal in all of this is to move to a carbonless system. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if it, if it actually happens in five years or eight years. Well, that's <laughs> part of the smart grid testbed project is that we want to accelerate our understanding of what it means to have a smart grid yeah. and to have this high penetration of customer resources yeah. on the system. What does that mean to the distribution system and what does that mean to the grid? How does it operate? Can you balance a lot of wind onto that system? And how is it done? Okay. And so far with what you know from the test beds, is it successful? Well, consider we just started six months ago. We're hopeful. It's been it's been going well so far. Yeah, and how long will the test go? Well, um, we have a window of about two and a half years uh, for phase one. We went to the commission with a proposal for phase one with an expectation that we may come back for phase two. And phase one, we're looking to better understand the partnership with the customer. So we need to educate our customers, better understand what products and services we can bring forward to them that they would participate in. And then in phase two, we <coughs> work with the customer, again, that's our resource, to build that new smart grid where we have, you know, we'll have PV or solar rooftop units, we'll have batteries, we'll have smart water heaters, we'll have smart thermostats, smart EV chargers, and we can work with those resources to help balance the grid in a high renewables future. Okay. And you mentioned even refrigerators. I guess my refrigerator doesn't need to be on all the time? Refrigerator doesn't need to be on all the time. And your refrigerator, there was an actually a, a very interesting project in the UK where they aggregated a whole bunch of refrigerators and got just a little bit of wattage out of each little refrigerator but they were able to move the demand from those refrigerators minute by minute. And it provided a very valuable resource to the grid called ancillary services or balancing services. So they were able to balance wind and solar in part with refrigerators.